Let's Get Two presents Go, Go Astro! Go, Go Astros! A focus on H Town Hardball. Hey Siri, how did Jose Siri do last night? Jose Siri went four for five with two home runs and five RBIs against the Rangers yesterday. That seems pretty, pretty, pretty good. I'm James Christopher, host of Go Go Astros. We got a great show for you today, and I can't be in a better mood. Fifteen to one, beating the pants off of the Arlington Rangers. Because yes, that's right. They don't get to put Texas on their name anymore. Not after 2017. Great night of baseball for the Astros. Lead is now seven and six and a half, depending on if we're looking at Seattle or Oakland. And I think we can feel pretty confident that the division is going to be uh, the Astros at, by the end of the season. It's even looking good for the second seed in the playoffs, which I think is really what the Astros are aiming for. I think they match up pretty well with Chicago. And and frankly, nobody wants to see Toronto. And I think that's who's going to come through the wild card right now because they are beating the, they're they're beating everybody's ass. So things are looking good. We have a great episode for you today. Brian's here, Andy's here, so let's get to it. Now joining us on GoGo Go Astros, I call him the smartest guy on Astros Twitter. He might disagree, but that's just because he's humble. Welcome to the show, Brian Arbor. All right, so we're jumping back on with Brian Arbor after the Astros have demolished my least favorite team in the Major League Baseball universe. Maybe my least favorite team in all of sports. Uh, but Brian, you know, it's funny. You go back a couple of years ago. Every single time the Astros were trying to make a deal at the trade deadline, two names were always off limits, Whitley and Tucker. Whitley, the jury is far from out or still is very much still out in. Um, the writing doesn't look great. Tucker has been everything that's been advertised. Absolutely. And he is. I mean, so the first thing to note on all those sort of trade possibilities is, hey, they got Verlander, Cole, and Grinky without having to give up Cal Tucker. Right. And if you look at who they gave up in those deals, you know, there's not a lot of guys who you're looking at, you know, the, the mistakes this front office have made have been relatively few. And they certainly weren't in those deals, including figuring out that A, Cal Tucker was going to be a valuable player and B, they didn't have to give him up to get to get those guys. And we're now seeing the flowering of Cal Tucker. He had a very rough start, of course, in both 2018 and 2019. In 2018, he made his debut, 2019, he came up in both those years and like, and I don't know about this guy right here. He's, you know, striking out too much and not able to access his power. Well, he improved greatly between 2019 and 2020. He got everyday playing time in 2020, proved he's worth it. And now he is one of the best young players in baseball. And frankly, I think, I think the best offensive player on this team right now. Yeah. And it's, it, it's funny. Cause we talked about this at the beginning of the season where he wasn't hitting but he was when he would hit, it was going over the fence, right? Remember, he was leading the team yeah. in home runs with like 11, <laughs> but he was hitting 180 because he was hitting them right at people. What What is it about this guy that makes him as – because he sort of – he looks like Opie from, from you know, uh, the Andy Griffith show. Like, he sort of looks kind of like a big, lanky doofus. Yeah, until he hits a pop-up, and then every time he hits a pop-up, he turns into – you know, he goes Hulk, and yeah. he – you know, he smashes his, uh, you know, he smashes his back down. Uh, so we sort of see these two sides of him. Um, I mean, the short answer is he has really, he has really good power. And he is, you know, does that without sacrificing. I mean, there, there are guys better at this, but without sacrificing a ton of batting average. And, you know, one thing I noted when I was looking at him back early in the season and he was struggling is that, as much as he gets shifted, he doesn't have a huge, you know, he has pretty normal, again, all left-handed hitters pull the ball. He has pretty normal. He's willing to go up the middle as well. So he's not just a dead pull hitter. Um, he is up the middle to, uh, to, uh, to the right side. And, you know, he's able to access more of the field than some guys. And again, that works to his benefit. When we talk about Tucker and, you know, I think, he's fun to watch because he's got this big looping swing. You would think he should be a strikeout victim every time because of how big that swing is. And like you said, it just sort of explodes off his bat. When we think about the future of the team though, is it going to make possibly losing Correa a little bit easier to swallow knowing that he's going to be anchoring the lineup? I mean, a little bit easier to swallow, maybe not right in that sense. I mean, you, you lose, you know, you know, he lose the top player in the American League in war this season. So, you know, that would be, that's going to be an issue. But 
one thing, and when you look at what the Astros have done in the last couple of years, compare them to the Cubs who spent this off season, who spent this season trading so many other guys who are about to come up for free agency. Well, we lost Springer last year. We're going to lose Correa after this season, right? But we have developed in the last couple of years, Tucker, again, an all-star level player uh, in the everyday lineup. We've developed from Valdez and, um, and, and Luis Garcia, who look to be steady guys in the rotation, possibly with all-star upside, um, who are going to anchor the rotation for several years. We've developed Jordan Alvarez. There's still a bunch of young talent on this team, and therefore, you know, and they're not going to win 100 games this year like they did from 2017 to 2019. I don't think they're going to win 100 games next year, but I'm pretty sure they're going to enter next season as the favorites in the American League West. The window is not yet closed and may stay open for a little while. In part because of the big lanky guy in right field. Talk about defensively, though. I think he's better defensively than a lot of people give him credit for. Yeah, and I don't sort of in reading reports on him as a prospect, I don't remember his defense being, you know, like a key aspect. But you look at the numbers, you look at his play in right field, he is both like pretty much all the Astros, he is a steady player who doesn't make a lot of mistakes, um, doesn't make a lot of errors. So the floor is high on him, but also he's got good speed and good instincts and gets lots of balls, particularly in um, in right center. And again, a defensive value keeping runs off the board is that's just as good as putting a run on the board like the two run home run he had on Sunday. Well, you know, um, make plans and God laughs. And we had discussed, you know, talking about Kyle Tucker on this segment and then um, Jose Siri entered the chat. Um, I talked about it a little bit in the, in my opening, but just talk about what, what this guy did and what this guy sort of profiles for down the road. I mean, he, he set, he set a major league record. He's the first MLB player to have four hits and five RBIs in his first career start. Yeah, it was a, it was, it was a very fun game. So one is there seems to be, Siri seems to be a fun player and lots of players like him. He's energetic and enthusiastic. He is colorful, both in sort of how he plays the game and also in how he dresses, according to the photos I see. So uh, <laughs> I believe Sugarland had a dress like Jose Siri uh, road trip earlier this season. And, you know, um, you know, that he was hanging out with Fernando Tatis because they played winter ball together uh, when he came up in San Diego. And you could see both, you know, you know, this was not, you know, oh, hey, as, as Fernando he's, here's my friend Fernando and Fernando's like here's my friend Jose um, <laughs> so again he's a fun player he I think Chandler Rome uh, tweeted he pimped the ever-loving hell out of his first home run last night and uh, if I hit a major league home run I'd either pimp the ever-loving hell out of it or pass out from just you know <laughs> disbelief so yeah. but on sort of the more sort of serious rate of baseball elements of Jose Siri he had a very good year in Sugarland. Sugarland's not a hitter's park from what I from the numbers I've seen, uh, but he had a very good year in AAA. He seemed like another Astro outfielder who may have leveled up in AAA this year. He is fast. He's already stolen a couple bases. Um, he has a reputation for being a very good defender and be able to play all three positions. So, you know, he has potential to be a contributor not only as someone who pinch runs in the playoffs, but also as a fourth or fifth outfielder in the 2022-2023 seasons. Yeah, I mean, I thought when we saw the uh, the lineup and Brantley was out again, I thought, oh, great, we have a hole over there. I did not expect to see what we saw last night. It does uh, – you bring up an interesting point, though. You know, I think that evaluating a minor league system is probably as valuable as a preseason college football poll. You know, all we've heard all year is that the Astros have the 29th ranked, seat, ranked uh, system, and yet we've seen Chaz McCormick. And we've seen um, – why is my mind blanking on my new favorite Astro? Jake Myers. Jake Myers. Oh, man. And now we have Jose Siri all coming out of nowhere and and taking care of business. I mean, so what does that tell you about what the system looks like? Yeah, I mean, so most of those measures are based on the top 100 prospects that are prospects who are projected to be potential stars, potential, you know, above average players. Um, what we see in those guys, in, um, you know, in, in McCormick and Myers and now Siri, is guys who are potential as contributors, but, you know, avoiding having a huge, well, the Astros don't have a position where there's a huge hole and you say, like, uh, I don't know what they're going to do with that position, you know, 
you know, this year in the playoffs or sort of long term. And part of that this year in center field has been they have these minor league players who have been developed. None of these were star level, you know, you know, Kyle right. Tucker was the fifth pick in the draft. And so you expect that guy, you know, to be a star. Um, Jake Myers was a 13th round pick. You, you just hope that guy gets to the, you know, they've already won that pick by getting to the majors and getting any type of contribution from that pick. So again, this is uh, something where it's, it, you know, Kyle Tucker is a player who raises your ceiling. Jake Myers, Chaz McCormick, Jose Siri are players who lift your floor. You need some of both and being able to lift your floor to be able to say, you know, we have competent center fielders who we can put at the bottom of the lineup. They can catch the ball. They can hit the, they, you know, they can hit a home run occasionally. They can do stuff to contribute to the team is exceedingly value. Having a scar in one place in the lineup like that is really bad. You know, is a real problem if you want to try to win 95 uh, wins like this team will this year and wants to do next year. I think Jake Myers is a star in, in, in waiting. Mm-hmm. He's got the I, flow. I, I mean, he is, he is, he is a ball player, man. Yeah. The thing I'm watching on Jake Myers that worries me is his walk rate is very low. And so that's the thing that is, I'm sort of looking, he drew a walk last night and I get excited every time he draws a walk, he's drawn now six this season, uh, which is a low number, but uh, has increased a little in the last couple of days. And so that's the skill I'm watching for Jake Myers. You know, one big thing about Jake Myers, when he hits the ball, he hits it hard. And that is always <laughs> a good thing. Yeah. So, I mean, it looks like we are, um, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I hate to be the guy that, that dances with the baseball gods, but mm-hmm. six and a half game lead with what, 20 to go, seven, ha- seven games over Oakland. Mm-hmm. Boy, they fell off a cliff. Um, is now really the time to start really worrying about positioning ourselves for making sure we keep the number two seed? Uh, yes. I mean, so the Astros are at a 99% uh, chance of winning the American League West, according to fan graphs this morning. Um, and, you know, it would take a major collapse of baseball historic proportions. And the good news for the Astros is they play the Rangers and the Diamondbacks this week. So it's a good opportunity to, again, you know, get some wins. And you don't have to if you get the Astros win like last night. It doesn't matter that the Mariners won late against the Red Sox. You right. Have to sort of, uh, you know, you can go to bed and wake up in the morning and say whatever. Um so, yeah, it, it's, you know, this is a, this is, they're now in a position, and I think they've been this way for a week or so now, where, you know, they can evaluate the last couple roster spots, who's going to be the last few guys in the bullpen, which of the left-handers, are they going to take both of the left-handers, both Taylor and Rayleigh, onto the uh, postseason roster, or do they think they just need one of them? And again, both of them pitched last night, and some of that was, you know, in the late innings, and some of that was an audition for that reason. Which of these guys is pitching well enough? Which of these guys has, you know, uh, is going to avoid sort of, you know, their blowups? Um, you know, so that's where they can really sort of focus. If they get Taylor Jones back in the next couple of days, should he or Marwin or Jose Siri be the last guy on the bench? I guess Garrett Stubbs is the other guy in that conversation. There's two roster spots between the two of them. Uh, between the four of those players. And again, they can sort of make their evaluation on what they think is best and what type of scenarios they think they'll use those guys in, in, uh, in, in the playoffs. Yeah, it's funny. You know, I think um, it, it's, you know, obviously we're fired up about Jose Siri. I think Taylor Jones probably lends himself to be a little bit more um, flexible in the postseason. But um, one thing I wanted to ask you before we got out of here is, is it feels like I don't even know that I'd put Christian Javier on a postseason roster right now. And I think I th- I'm a big fan of Christian Javier, and I think he's got a place in the Astros rotation going forward. But I think they've mismanaged him so much that he seems like I don't know that I trust him to get three outs in, in a playoff game. Yeah, I mean, he is a player with um... – He's a player with control issues and ha- has had that all season, and those have been exacerbated in the last six weeks or so. Um, so he pitched okay last. I mean, he had, last night he had a ton. Of, he had too many walks, but he also had a bunch of strikeouts. Um, he also seemed to just, you know, just take way too many pitches to get through sort of uh, what he was doing. So I think he certainly. Look, the, the three guys they want to use in relief are Presley, Graveman, and Stanek. And they will try to concentrate as many of their innings, particularly their high leverage innings, among those players. 
Um, you'll probably, the fourth most valuable reliever will probably be the starter, the fifth starter who doesn't make the rotation, whether that's uh, or Keedy or Grinky, I think would be the most likely candidates for that at this point. And then everyone else in the bullpen is kind of like, you know, we want to pick the right spot to have them in. We want to, we, you know, we're sort of worried about them in the middle innings. And, you know, Javier is certainly on that list. I think he's too talented to keep off of the roster. It's also not sure to me who would sort of replace him, whether that would be, you know, you know, whether that would be, you know, Josh James or Brandon Belak or sort of names that I go like, I'm not sure. I don't think that any of those guys have the potential to give you, you know, two and a half, you know, you know, two and a third real solid innings in the middle to get you to the, uh, to the guy. But yeah, it'd be really nice to see that from Javier. Feel good about him walking into the last uh, three weeks of the season. Well, we feel really good about you. We'll see you next week. Um, hopefully we, we have a four game sweep ahead of us because we, we, we need to take care of business in Arlington. Hey, if they score 15 runs every night in Arlington, win every game by two touchdowns, um, whether that's the, uh, you know, whether that's the uh, Astros or the Texans, I'd be happy with that. Uh, we just parted ways. Yes, we did. I know. Yeah. All right. Go Cowboys. And next up on Go Go Astros, he calls himself a full time curmudgeon, but all that curmudgeonness goes out the window after an episode with Ted Lasso. Welcome to the show, Andy Tom Chesson. All right, we're jumping on Go Go Astros with Andy Tom Chesson, and he's told me there'll be math on this episode. So already I'm like, I'm going to. Or maybe up. just. Maybe just numbers. Maybe just numbers. I don't need to cuddle up into the uh, the fetal position. Listen, I asked Brian this, and I'm going to ask you this too. Um, you know, Jose Siri, a lot of fun, a uh, lot of swagger, set a major league record with his performance last night. Um, pretty. Does he get thrown at today after, like, pimping that home run the way he did, pimping both of them? I mean, I, between him and Javier trying to take out Garcia, uh, and I know that was unintentional because Javier has no control. I assume somebody's going to get thrown at in the series. I don't know who it's going to be exactly. Um, but, yeah, the Rangers um, probably have a bunch of young guys. They're a little bit hot-headed right now because they've been getting their um, ish po- pounded in for, you know, a minute this season. Um, and, and they've got a bunch of young, hungry guys up now. And so, you know, I fully, fully expect shenanigans to happen. The fact that that's, you know, your, your rival down in Houston that you can't seem to beat anymore um, certainly probably doesn't help things. So, yeah, I, I expect some foolishness at some point today or tomorrow. But I also expect Dusty to, Dusty to bench Jose Siri tonight because why would you play him two days in a row? <laughs> You know, and especially being a four game series, right? Like that yeah. can definitely add to the angst. Um, we don't have an ace on this team, I don't he, think. Well, he uh, he's in Los Angeles right now, um, with his incredibly beautiful wife and his daughter, and uh, he doesn't make visits to Houston, which causes some at Twitter, uh, to not be happy with him. But, um, I don't know that I'd be leaving that I'm like, <laughs> to go sit in Minute Maid Park. <laughs> Me neither. Um, Kate, yeah, I think, you know, the closest, the closest that we have. Um, yeah, Kate, Kate, dollar Don't dog go. night. Um, <laughs> you tell me, it, you know, the closest we have is, is probably Lance McCullers at this point. And I think, um, the conversation, and I'm probably repeating it, repeating other conversations at this point, but uh, ace ish, maybe kind of. If he's concentrating and isn't throwing 30 pitches an inning, all right, I, I guess McCullers by default is who you go with. The 30 pitches an inning, that's been every single start for the last four or five starts, either the first or the second inning has been incredibly mm-hmm. long. And I don't know how you can consider yourself an ace if you already have Dusty thinking, okay, now I'm going to the bullpen in the sixth or the seventh inning. Yeah, I mean, it's ultimately a control issue, which ultimately is a is a concentration issue when you've got his kind of stuff and have the ability to throw the pitches he has across the plate. He just loses it at an, an inning at a time. Um, I think he has gotten better. I want to give him credit about managing through an error behind him or managing through giving up a seeing eye single or some of the other things that used to completely derail him. But what that's turned into now is that when a runner gets on, 
he gets super cautious and forgets just throw strikes. You've got the best defense in baseball or certainly in the American League behind you. Let them make plays. Um, and, and I think that's, again, something he's going to have to grow into and mature. And, you know, at, to quote uh, your second favorite baseball movie, ground balls are democratic. Throw them. Strikeouts are fascist. <laughs> that is such a good line. It's really a good line. Like it's really good. It's like real. It's that's really well written. Like I, I don't know. Um, well, Ron Shelton does, you know, tend to write things well. Yeah, I know. It's just sometimes, like as a filmmaker and a writer, I'm like, I, I find myself realizing, like, that's good writing. Like we need to celebrate that more. So we are sitting here. We've got about what twenty games left. Um, Sixteen. Sixteen games left. Sixteen games left, and thirteen games in the magic number. Okay. So uh, how are we feeling? Um, I mean. Take it away. How are we feeling? Um, you know, winning um, winning the series against Anaheim and Los Angeles, uh, Culver City, whatever they are. I, I keep lost. Knott's Berry Farm Angels. Um, uh, you mean the only sports franchise in the L.A. area with, and, and in fact, most of California with an actual original moniker? Yeah, those guys. That, yeah, absolutely. Uh, winning that series, uh, being three and one since the last time we recorded certainly puts me in a better frame of mind because, um, you know, was 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 pre- feeling pretty dark last week. Um, I think if I'm if I'm calculating correctly, we've got six home games left. We've got ten road games left, counting uh, this last three in Arlington. Uh, we win at a six twenty five clip in on at home, and unlike Astros teams in the past, and this is probably the real difference in the record between the nineteen eighteen and seventeen teams. On the road, we're not as good as we have been. We're a five forty nine team. Not bad, but not not as good as the Astros have been over the last five years. And so, you know, work out that math. I think we're 10 and six over these last games. Now, this is completely ignoring the fact that we have been 500 since the All-Star break. I, you, you look at the opponents that we have coming up, three against the Rangers, three against the Diamondbacks, four against the Angels. You hope that you've got eight wins in that 10-game group. Because if you do, I think you've – clinch the division before you get to Oakland on the 24th of September. Um, if not, and, you know, that assumes that Oakland goes five and five over their next 10, which, you know, they don't have the Royals flu like the Astros seem to do. They've got three <laughs> against the Royals this week, but they also play the Angels three games. And then they've got a big set against the Mariners with four games in Seattle or in Oakland. Yeah. In Oakland. Um, but the Mariners have played really, really well. And I think, you know, you look at what Oakland's done lately and the issues that they're having, I think they're five and five. If they go five and five, we win eight. We've clinched the division prior to get, arriving in uh, Alameda County, which is the goal at this point. And that puts us at 94 wins, which I think is one off your 95 to win the division. Um, and that's not to say we couldn't do better than, you know, that in this next little stretch, but I, th- I think that's where we are. So I'm, I'm up from the 90 I was expecting last week. Uh, <laughs> but, um, I, you know, this isn't a 100 win team. I don't know that there is, you know, a 100 win team in the American League this year. Rays have a chance, but um, they've also got to stay focused on, they've run away with that American League East division and all the action seems to be for the wild card out of that division. So uh, I think the Astros are in a good position right now. They really need to take care of business. And if I have hesitation, it's because they really have struggled taking care of business against teams that are below 500 this year uh, for a number of reasons. So I'm hoping they're finally getting healthy, getting on a roll. Um, and, you know, let, let, let Jose Siri play let, <laughs> until he doesn't hit. Uh, let Jake Myers play until he doesn't hit. Put Chaz McCormick in. We don't need Brantley right now because Brantley could rest up until the first game of the you know pitch of the playoffs and come out and go three for four. Yeah. Is that a hitter? Um, I don't think he needs to gear up to get back in the lineup. Uh, so, I, you know, I think Bregman's getting hot. Alvarez is certainly getting hot. Altuve's warming up. Um, so you've got a lot of pieces that are moving in a positive direction right now. Ask me again after this Ranger series. I might have a different answer. But um, things look good right now. Things look good. And I think, um, you know, you talk about the Rays. They they pretty much have wrapped up the division and the number one seed. I mean, I think they oh, yeah. have won a five or six game lead on yep. the Astros. Four, four Astros and a half right now. Um, and the Astros have a two game lead on, on Chicago. 
And I like, I'm sorry, I like that matchup, especially how banged up Chicago is right now. Obviously, a lot can change before October. Well, and I will say before I make the statement I'm going to make, Chicago, the White Sox are a very solid team. They've got very good starting pitching. They've got very good offense, and they very easily could get hot and win a series in the playoffs and advance to the American League Central, your American League Championship Series. I don't think they beat the Rays. But the White Sox, in my mind, suffer from what the Indians have suffered from for the last couple of seasons, uh, making the playoffs. But you look at who they play the bulk of their games against, four of the six worst teams in the American League are in the American League Central. Yeah. So you're playing the bulk of your games against the Tigers, the Royals, the Indians, and the Twins, and they've all been really, really bad this year. I mean, really, they're all below 500. There's nobody else in their division that's close to, you know, challenging the White Sox. And so I don't know how much the White Sox have been challenged, and they're still behind the Astros in the standings. So I, I, I don't know that you know what you're going to get with the White Sox. And that uncertainty uh, and knowing how poorly they played in the playoffs last year and, and how much playoff experience the Astros have, I think that puts that series, you know, a couple tick marks in the Astros' favor. And having said that, White Sox have a lot of talent certainly could get hot at the right time. Um, and they've shown this year that home field is going to make a big difference in who eventually wins that series if things end up the way they're currently lined up. Yeah, I mean, in, in they played seven times. Houston won five of them, four yes. of which were – four of those wins came out of Minute Maid Park. And it does look like Chicago's a little beat up. But that's, you know, many slip twixt a cup and a lip before we get there. Um, let's talk a little bit about – it seems like we can't have a six man rotation. No, because as soon as we do, somebody dies. Uh, late, late as death was Jake Odorizzi. Uh, and frankly, Astros fans have been calling him for his demise all season long. So <laughs> I don't know how much of a loss that is. I do know that, um, you know, in the interest of chess versus checkers, he made sure that Dusty was not going to pull him in the fifth inning last night. <laughs> Do we have any update on the injury? I mean, it looked weird. It, nothing about him looked weird. Like he covered the base just fine. I don't. My guess, I mean, it's a leg injury, I would guess, because they've said nothing. Um, there's been nothing on Twitter, nothing post game about. Store what... foot is the only thing I've seen. Yeah. And I'm guessing he probably twisted his ankle or stepped on the bag wrong and it was on his plant foot and he didn't feel he could deliver pitches anymore. He was certainly frustrated about leaving the game. He didn't want to leave the game. He was pitching well. Um, But I I think you're at the stage of the season where there's no point in taking chances on it. Yeah. And frankly, I was happy to see Javier get stretched out a little bit and get some work uh, and get to work through some of his issues. Um, because he's a guy that you're going to need to perform in the playoffs and he can't come in and just walk batter after batter like he has been. So, and I was amazed to see that uh, walking into last night, he had like less than a three and a half ERA for all his struggles. uh, Javier is still a very valuable piece of the the bullpen picture. Uh, He needs to get right. And the more work he gets, the more right he's going to get. And, you know, if you're going to work, you're going to work, you might as well be working against the Diamondbacks and the Rangers. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, this does look like, to your point, there are three more games against the Rangers and then three games against the Diamondbacks. Those are all very winnable baseball games, and it would be nice to put some of this to bed early so you can start getting ready for the playoff run. Yep. And, you know, uh, on the counter to that is I think our hitters have been either injured or inconsistent so much this year that I think, you know, letting them play – four out of every five days, uh, getting Bregman uh, to a point where he's hot and staying hot. I think he's seeing the ball really, really well. Getting Correa back to feeling that his swing is sexy, whatever the hell that means <laughs> to hit him. Because Come on, I'm man, scared. it's sexy. Yeah, but I don't know what that means because he's gone over 27 and said his swing feels sexy. So I don't know what that means, but I want him to be there. I want it for him, so let him have it, but they need to get consistent work. I want Alvarez – to be on fire by the time we get in the playoffs, because I think he is one of the players on this roster and truly one of the players in major league baseball, really high on Jordan Alvarez. If you can't tell oh, yeah. that can take over a game and can alter another team's game plan playing uh, on the way they pitch an entire roster. Um, I think Kyle Tucker, who I haven't mentioned yet today, 
is in a really good place and really seeing the ball well and is, uh, you know, short of last night and look at where he finished up last night. Um, he's knocking on the door of a 300 season. And you have, I, you and I have had offline conversations that he's probably a 260, 270 guy because of the big hole in his swing. He has certainly made the adjustment this year to mitigate that. And um, he's, he's finding a lot more pitches. In well, the, in let's that. not forget that this guy predicted he'd have a higher, he'd have higher batting average and OPS than Correa would by the end of the season. Now, I don't know where they're matching up right now, but it's got to be close. Uh, yeah, I think Correa probably wins OPS right now. Um, but uh, Tucker's blowing him away on average, has more RBIs, um, and is what I consider impact plays from an offense or impact hits. He is hitting the ball when we need hits. He's he won the game uh, Sunday against Anaheim, which was a it was a good game. It's pitcher's duel. Maybe yeah. it should have been with who the Angels threw at us. But it was, and he won the game with a really, really good at bat. Um, and he's done that more and more as the season goes on. And as much as we pick on uh, Jeff Lunau for being in love with some of his prospects, Frankie Tuesday being one of them, um, <sighs> Kyle Tucker was absolutely the right call to hold on to. Um, and I think he is somebody who's on the verge of a big, big breakout beyond even what he's done this year. I guess then the big question we come back to then will be playoff rotation, right? Um, who's your number one? I mean, at this point, probably McCullers. I think it's going to depend on how – what we do over this next 10 games will determine what we have to do in the six games following that. I would love to see that we do nothing against the Rays, and I honestly don't care if we win a single game against the Rays in this last series – It'd be nice, and there is some precedent because we had to play Boston in 2017 in a three-game series prior to facing them in the playoffs. And we won those, I think, two of those three games in Boston prior to starting the playoffs. So I think that was a good step. But I'd also rather, if you're going to empty your bench, Dusty, that's the series to do it in, provided that you've wrapped the division because there's not anywhere to go. There's no real benefit of overexerting yourself other than getting guys their swings. Um, so, I, you know, having said all that, I think McCullers is your one. I think Grinky is your two. Mm-hmm. Um, Garcia is probably your three in a short game series with a tandem on behind him. I know. So maybe Garcia is. Valdez in the three. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, and I, I, it sucks that I didn't think of Fromber first, but I trust Garcia more in his control more right now. And knowing that you could tell him you've got four in innings just blow the doors out and, and that he would be he'd produce more and I think Fromber can pitch out of the bullpen he's proven that he can do it um, I think that certainly switches up if you advance past a, you know a three-man rotation um, but you also have Urquidy back who can tandem on Garcia as well if you're if Valdez is your three or four um, but I certainly see you know piling up some pitchers and then you don't know what's happening with Oda Rizzi. If he's healthy by the playoffs, I think he plays a role as well. I think he's got too much experience to leave on the bench, um, even if it's, you know, long relief type situation. Um, so right now my one and two are McCullers and Grinky um, because I believe I believe in Zach in a playoff uh, playoff series. I also I loved his line here that he can give he can give the Astros whatever they ask for. And frankly, it hasn't been that much. I know. Petty. We're getting petty over here down in H-Town. I guess uh, how, much of it, how much of it matters, though, you know, Granky's got much better numbers at home than he does on the road. I mean, how much do you, when you decide to slot Granky in, does whether or not the Astros have home field advantage matter? Um, you know, the biggest advantage to Zach Granky is that Zach Granky slows down your bat. Um so, I, you know, I think there's some tactical advantage of even maybe pitching him in the first game if you know you're at home against the White Sox, for instance, uh, and slowing up those power hitters a little bit and then coming back the next day or even coming back, you know, coming in with Stanek, uh, Graveman, and Presley at the end of that game and really watching them have to struggle to catch up. And then you've got McCullers, who's a completely different kind of pitcher, uh, power breaking stuff, um, who can befuddle befuddled and great hitters. Uh, and then you've got, you know, uh, Fromber with his left-handed curveballs. 
Um, and when he's on, as good as any pitcher we have, uh, Garcia, Urquidy, um, you know, however that works out, I think they're better on the road. Um, or I think they're as good on the road, uh, certainly better than Grinky is on the road. So I think yeah. you can't shuffle it that way. But I, I think regardless of how it starts, I think McCullers Grinky is your one too, um, because you get up two games in a seven game series. That's pretty good. Um, and you, you're wanting to take your best shot at home, I think. All right. Well, we're taking our best shot. We'll be back next week. Andy New and I will be live and in person in Bowling Green, Kentucky this weekend. Looking forward to it. Yeah, you're letting me on the main show again. I really appreciate it after the suspension. I did not know what they had put in my smoothie, um, and I still am very adamant that I did not take anything illegal, but I understand the rules of the game, and I submit to the commissioner's findings. You go back up to the Premier League from the Champions League. Or is it the Champions League or the Champion Premier Playoff something? I, it's a very confusing league. Very confusing league. All right, we'll talk to you later, man. Have a good day. So that does wrap. So that does wrap us up. And look, I just hope that they keep dominating Arlington, and not just because I hate them. And I think that there are a few teams that I hate as much as I hate the Rangers. I, um, you know, I hate Washington in, in the NFL, and I of course hate OU. And I'm not a very big fan of the Cubs or the Dodgers, but for me, it's personal with Arlington. So not only do I hope to just keep beating them, because I think that's the 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 when the universe is right and all the stars are aligned, that's what's happening. But I haven't been able to use my favorite GIF in a while, the the orbit streaking thing. So hopefully that's going to happen the next couple of days. Until next time, go Strohs.